Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. And <clears throat> my name is John Nieland, like I said, and I'm uh, studying the silent adversaries that affect so many people we love. It's brain diseases. So brain diseases are pr uh, diseases where the communication between the brain and the body is failing. And they have been known for more than 200 years. And in these 200 years, no medicine has been developed that can stop the disease, let alone cure it. So, and that's actually uh, pretty uh, bad. <laughs> so, what I want to talk to you today is take you to this journey that I took while figuring out how, what is the cause of that people can develop brain diseases, how do they develop, and uh, for also what can we do against it? Are there new ways of treating actually brain diseases? And not only that, also what you as a, pa a patient or a, a person that is a at risk for developing brain diseases can do. And uh, so to start the, whole, the journey that I took, I first looked into what is actually, uh, what are the symptoms of brain diseases? Which, uh, what, are the, what is it uh, in common? And I looked at ALS, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer, but actually you can extend this list to a lot of different more brain diseases. And what struck me was that if you look at these brain diseases, they all have the same symptoms. Independent of which brain disease you look at, you see the whole list, inflammation, oxidative stress, demyelination, neurotransmitter disturbances, protein aggregation, and the whole is down to mitochondrial dysfunction and shortage of energy. So, how, and if a doctor is going to give you medicine, he will try to treat one of these blue marked symptoms. He will treat some symptoms, he doesn't treat the disease. So, <clears throat> when you think about it, could it be that there is something that's actually driving all these symptoms? That all these symptoms come from a certain theme that's happening in your brain and that makes you sick. And what my specially I focused on was energy generation. Could it be that energy generation, because all patients with brain diseases have a shortage of energy, they always are tired. So could it be that that maybe is the link that we are uh, looking for? So let's look into <clears throat> how energy is actually generated in your body. So if you have your cells, every cell in your body, you have these blue organelles, <clears throat> and in these blue organelles, also called mitochondria, these are actually the energy factories in your cell. And as a fuel, they can use two different types, predominantly, uh, either glucose or fats, lipids. And if glucose comes into your cell, it's being converted into pyruvate. Pyruvate is then being transported into the mitochondria, converted into uh, acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA goes into a process we call Krebs cycle. And in Krebs cycle, you produce energy, and in biology, energy is ATP. Alternatively, you can have lipids coming into your cells, and then lipids are being transported into the mitochondria with the help of a molecule called CPT1. CPT1, then after the lipids come in, in your mitochondria, they come into a process called beta oxidation. There you produce acetyl-CoA from lipids, come into a Krebs cycle again, and you get ATP energy out. What is the difference between these two? Well, if you compare lipids and, glu and glucose to produce energy, you use about twice the amount of oxygen to, you, to metabolize lipids. So this means that the brain is actually, that's the reason why in the brain you use predominantly glucose, because you, the brain is so massive, you cannot give all the ox get all the oxygen in the brain if you would just use lipids the whole time. So if you then, uh, so let's look into what this means actually. So if you have a healthy brain, then you have a high glucose metabolism, very low lipid metabolism. What happens if you now put stress on your person, and I will come to the types of stress you can put on a person, then actually the metabolism in the brain starts shifting from a glucose to a lipid metabolism. Now you get high lipid metabolism, very low glucose metabolism. This may, and specifically, if this happens over several cycles of very extreme uh, stress, you get stuck in this high lipid, low glucose metabolism. And this makes that you get mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction means that the mitochondria are not able to produce the energy anymore that they need actually to do the function in your body. 
So, and why is that? Well, the, like said, if you use too much lipid, you get oxidative stress. If you get oxidative stress, you get molecules like hydrogen peroxide produced or other reactive oxygen species. And these molecules are denaturing proteins in your body. So like beta amyloid, alpha synuclein, and a lot of these other ones. And in addition, what it does, it also damages your DNA. So that's one problem. The next problem is, is that if you have high lipid metabolism under a stress situation, you start producing in your brain molecules like uh, prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, what they do is they attract the whole immune system to your brain. That is this happening. And they are starting to activate the immune system. Now you get inflammation in your brain. So you have inflammation, oxidative stress. When we look at where uh, lipids are so important in your brain, because lipids are very important in your brain, they are important in a substance called myelin. Myelin is about 70% lipid. However, these lipids, they fall off constantly. About half, like, half of the molecules fall off in about three days. That's no problem for your brain because you have oligodendrocytes. They can put them back on again. Men, but when I'm now going to metabolize lipids locally, I get a sink in lipid levels, and I cannot replenish these lipids anymore on your myelin. And this myelin is actually like the isolation around your neurons. It's like the plastic around the copper wire. So it makes that you do not get short-circuited. But what it also does, it makes that the signals through your body go 10 times faster as when you do not have myelin. And the signal, so when you lose myelin, your signals go slower, and what happens, you get this coordination of your muscles. So you get shaking, in Parkinson's, or you cannot control your muscles in your legs or other things. Another thing is, is that when you get a myelin, it makes that the, you only use 10% of the energy to transmit your signals. So you use only a tenth of the energy that you otherwise would use. When you lose myelin, so you need to have 10 times more energy to get your signals in your body. Where does the energy come from? lipid metabolism. So you can see the whole uh, <coughs> cycle and the scheme. In addition, when you get stuck into lipid metabolism, you do not use the glucose metabolism anymore. When you do not use glucose, so the glucose levels in your body start rising. So people are often diagnosed as diabetic type 2. <coughs> and, but what is more important is now, because the glucose levels rise, the bacteria in your gut start shifting. The ones that stimulate brain diseases come up. The ones that block brain diseases or protect for brain diseases, they are starting to disappear. This all is a physical cycle that goes from a healthy brain to brain disease. Of course, this sounds like a lot of theory. Do we have actually any proof for this? Well, <clears throat> let's look into it. If a doctor wants to know if you have a brain disease, they can do a technology like FDG PET scanning. And in FDG PET scanning, what they measure is actually glucose metabolism. If you look at a healthy brain on the left-hand side, then you see it's very red because a lot of glucose is being used in your brain. However, when you have a patient with Alzheimer's disease, there's hardly any red left. This sort of means that the glucose metabolism is really downregulated. When you go to a doctor in the old days, they would say, well, that's because all the neurons have died off, so they, they not, do not use any glucose anymore. That's not really true, because if there would, would be so many neurons should be dying off before you get this. An easier explanation would be, well, they have shifted to lipid metabolism. So, and this is for Alzheimer's, but we can do the same pictures. And recently, uh, 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 in Norway, some researchers have shown that actually this is really happening, that the lipid metabolism is upregulating these patients. And other data that we have is actually based in, uh, in some mutations that we have from the CPT1 molecule. As I told you, CPT1 is really important for transporting lipids into the mitochondria. These mutations, one is in the uterites, that downregulates CPT1 activity, but the most interesting one is actually the one in the Inuit population. This, this mutation is actually downregulating the transport of lipids into your mitochondria by tw to 23% of what it normally is. 
So they have highly downregulated lipid metabolism. When I saw this, I contacted a doctor that is actually treating and also was part of the article, Laura Arbor, and asked her what the incidence rate of multiple sclerosis was in the Inuit population. But what she said was, I never seen a patient with multiple sclerosis. She went through the hospital records, looked at 20,000 patients with multiple sclerosis. None of them was of the Inuit background. So we looked into literature. We found very, very few <coughs> that have multiple sclerosis. So we have an incidence rate of two per 100,000 in the Inuit population, where in the normal of the general Canadian American population, the incidence rate is 285 per 100,000. We also looked at ALS. In the Inuit population, the incidence of ALS is 0 0.6 per 100,000, where in the general Canadian US population, it's 4 per 100,000. It's also highly downregulated. Now you can say, well, <clears throat> that's fine, but they maybe do not get to the hospital. They don't get diagnosed. They eat a lot of fish. Fish is actually really good <laughs> for perfect, but then, uh, protecting against brain diseases. So there's a lot of other reasons why this could be. So what we did, <clears throat> we generated a mouse that has the exact same mutation as in the Inuit population. And when we tried to induce Parkinson's disease on the left-hand side, and here we look at uh, uh, cognitive function, then we see that the red ones where you have wild-type CPT1, it's completely down, where in the ones with the CPT1A mutation, it's normal, it's just like the wild-type mice that never receive, receive a gut, where you never try to induce Parkinson's disease. When we try to induce multiple sclerosis, which you call EAE in the mouse, then if we do it in the wild-type mice, after 10 days they get symptoms, and two weeks later they're all dead. When we do it in the CPT1A mutant animals, they get a little bit symptom, but in the end they're doing fine. <clears throat> When we have look at ALS induction in these mice, when we cross the mice with an SOD1 mutant mice, when you have the SOD1 mutant mice and wild type CPT1, all animals are dead at 150 days. When we have it with a CPT1A mutation, we still have 45% survival. So the data we see in the humans fits actually perfectly with the ones in the mice. So it's probably true that uh, downregulated lipid metabolism is, is uh, protecting for brain disease. Now you think, well, <clears throat> we can, of course, not start mutating everyone <laughs> with brain disease for CPT1. <laughs> so what we did, <clears throat> we tried to develop a medicine. And, we, and the medicine we called mitometin, for mitochondrial metabolism inhibitor. When we do that, uh, here we have also, again, the SOD1 animals. So at 75 days, they get the first symptoms of uh, ALS. At 100 days, they have full-blown ALS. And there we start treating uh, these animals with either placebo, that's in the red, and these mice are dead after 137 days. When we actually give the medicine at, the, at day 100 and start giving that every day, then we still have 75% of the animals alive. When we use the best medicine that's actually given to ALS patients, that's ridosol in Europe and ridosol and endeavoron in the United States, they are doing as worse as the placebo-treated animals. So we have a way of treating animals. And this is ALS, but in Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis, the data are even better. So if we now start to look at the scheme that we have for brain diseases, how do we fit it in now? Well, first of all, not everyone will get brain diseases. People, some people with small point mutations, uh, like PARC2 mutation, c 9 orth mutation, and there are numerous mutations could make, that can make you sensitive for developing brain diseases. It doesn't mean you get it or when you get it. It only makes, means that you are at risk. It's like smoking gives you a risk for getting cancer. Uh, but what that makes that you get the disease is when you put uh, stress on this patient. Because, for instance, psychological stress, the American and Danish military, they have about twice the incidence rate of ALS versus the general American and, and Danish population. Or physical stress, stress, for instance, American football players or boxers, they have an increased risk of getting brain diseases could be pathological stress because of bacterial viral infections, 
or toxicological stress, for instance, by a ferrotenone in Parkinson's or arsenic in uh, ALS. But it could also be dietary stress. For instance, the Western diet, high fat, high glucose diet, that's actually not so good. And that makes that you in the end get mitochondrial dysfunction, where you also have the uh, predisposition of a mutation. And that makes that you in the end get brain diseases. So, of course, we are trying to develop medicine. And hopefully we are <coughs> so far that we can get a medicine in patients mid next year. Um, but what can you do so yourself as a patient? Well, there's a lot you can do, actually. If you think about what we show is that fat metabolism is actually important for brain diseases. Well, what kinds of fat is actually important? That's saturated fats. Fats from cow meat, pig meat, or your own body fat. That's actually the ones that are easily transported into the mitochondria to be burned and give you a fat metabolism, a lipid metabolism. What you actually can also do is add, eat uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids from fish oil or vegetable oil, olive oil, avocado oil. They are actually really good. And why? Because what they, the CPT1 has a problem, has a hard time to transport it into the mitochondria. If it's, it's like a truck on the highway that goes 80 miles an hour, of 80 kilometers an hour, it's, you, it blocks actually the road, so the transport is going slower, not only from the unsaturated fats, but also saturated fats. And so that's what these do. And thereby, you slow down fat metabolism, and you give glucose metabolism a chance to take over again. In addition, uh, now you maybe think, okay, I eat a lot of sugar and a lot of uh, vegetable oil. Well, that doesn't really work, because if you do that, you have too much energy in your body from these things, and what do you make of this? Body fat, <laughs> which is bad. Okay. So, <laughs> so you have to be careful what you eat. <clears throat> Another thing you can do is do exercise. Because first of all, with exercise, you, use body, you lose body fat, <laughs> which is good. And the other thing is actually you're oiling your mitochondria to shift back and forth from glucose to lipid and back to glucose metabolism. And the more you train, the better it goes. It's like oiling your car you're now oiling your mitochondria to do the same thing. And in addition, what you do is you produce a lot of antioxidants, and they are actually also protecting you from hypoxia. So, thank you very much.